time, uh, my mind starts to wander, and um, Amy and my kids can attest to this. Um, I am notorious. Wives, do not nudge your husbands here. I'm notorious for letting my mind wander. It's not that I can't hear. It's that I don't listen. Um, I, that's just me. That's just me. Some of you husbands are like, no, I listen. I totally listen. Don't listen to him. Um, but, but I let my mind wander, and I start to focus on things, and, and, I, and I'll oftentimes find myself going, how, how did I even get on this track. I, I'm not sure, but um, uh, earlier this week, I was actually out in my front yard, and I think I was, I can't even remember what I was supposed to be doing, so that's what happens, right? Um, but, I, but I noticed that, um, that the tree in my front yard had no leaves left on it, none whatsoever. And, and, and I, I don't know if this was God or if this was just me and my own uh, line of thinking, but, but this thought occurred to me. I thought, you know, when this tree has leaves, I look at it and I say, wow, that's a beautiful tree. When those leaves start to change color, I, I, I look at that tree and I look at those leaves and I go, wow, the, the fruit that, that that tree is is bearing, what what a what a beautiful tree it is. And then when the leaves fall fall off, I tend to see it as a curse because I have to go, those beautiful leaves now have to be raked up or they have to be cleaned up because I'm one of those that says, no, the leaves cannot stay on the lawn. They must be picked up. But I'm looking at this tree, and it's kind of gnarly looking. Before we moved in, whoever lived there topped the tree, and it just has always had this weird growth pattern to it. And, and, and I'm looking at this tree, and, and I started the, my mind started going, you know, what's really going on with a tree when there are no leaves? Is it just pointless? Is it just there? Is it, is, is it just taking up space. And so I decided to do a little bit of research. Now, I know there are probably people in this room who know way more about this than me. Um, and I have to admit, um, I got on Wikipedia for a little bit. So we all know that that's true because it's on the internet. But I, but I googled this. I googled, this is really long, what is a tree really doing when it goes dormant? Yeah, it didn't fit on my phone in the little space there. So I had to, did I type that right? So here's what I kind of learned. There's some, different, there's some different theories on this. There's some things that they actually do know. First of all, the tree is still alive. It just goes dormant. But one of the things that, that I had never thought of before is there's actually kind of a theory out there that trees actually need that time of dormancy to rest a little bit. Now, I'm not a, this is probably a bad word. I'm not like, I'm not a tree hugger person, so I'm not like going, oh, that's so cute. This tree is just resting. But actually, there's theories that say this is beneficial because when there are no leaves, the tree isn't working as hard, but the tree is still pulling up nutrients from the ground. The roots are still growing, although at a slower pace. But it actually, according to this theory, it actually prepares the tree for even greater growth in the spring and in the early summer. So what we see as barrenness and fruitlessness this theory particular, again, I don't know for sure, but this particular theory said that that's actually a very fruitful time for the tree because it can focus on its own deep roots and its trunk and its limbs so that when it's time to bear fruit, the fruit can be even better than it would have been otherwise. 
Well, we don't typically think of a vast desert area or a wilderness or, or barrenness as being a place for new things to begin or new things to grow, yet that's exactly where we find ourselves in our text for today. We're in Matthew chapter 3. And in Matthew chapter 3, verses 1 through 12, Matthew writes about John the Baptist. That's your cue, ladies. Thank you. <laughs> These girls are awesome. Speaking of our teenagers, uh, this is Maya and Kelsey. They're two of our seniors this year and um, our great leaders in our group. And they're going to read, read for us if you would actually stand, and we're going to read the Word of God. This is Matthew chapter 3, verses 1 through 12. Now, Maya gets to read while I change the slides today, so, uh, so you can get on to me if I don't do this right. Good okay? luck. Let's hear the Word of the Lord. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching the wilderness in, in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is he who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for heaven. John's clothes were made of camel's hair and a leather belt on his face. His food was locusts and wild honey. The people went out to him, all of Jerusalem and all of Judea and all the region. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to, coming to where he was baptizing, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath, produce fruit in keeping the repentance, and do not think you could say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. I tell you that out of these stones God can raise up children for Abraham. The axe is already at the root of the tree, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will cut down, will be cut down and thrown into the fire. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, ladies. Appreciate your help today. So this is one instance among many in Scripture where we see that new growth, fruitfulness, often comes after times of wilderness. If you remember, Moses receives God's call in the wilderness the people of God are delivered from Pharaoh and continually provided for in the wilderness. If you remember, Jesus spends 40 days in physical and emotional wilderness, in turmoil, in temptation, as he's tempted prior to his ministry here on earth. Now this passage here, chapter 3, verses 1 through 12, is often referred to as the new exodus. See, this takes place in the wilderness, just like the original Exodus did. There's a movement to a new place. There's a movement away from an old way or an old location, an old territory, an, an old place, and a movement to the new. And John reveals a couple of issues here, and we'll get into these things. But, but the first thing he reveals is this. See, the people that, that, that were coming to the wilderness, not just the Pharisees and the Sadducees, which they kind of get an extra little bit of a brunt of, of his um, honesty, we'll call it that. But people came, uh, and there was an issue that they had. And the first issue they had was that they thought because they were children of Abraham, that what they do doesn't really matter. See, they were already somebody, so who they were meant something, so what they did didn't really matter. He also revealed this, the repentance isn't only necessary, but it is urgent. 
See, John the Baptist is revealing a new way of living, and he points toward Jesus. He's preparing a path for the expected, the awaited Messiah. And we can hear, if we hear in John's voice, if we can put words into what's really going on here, John is, he's crying out. He's saying something new is happening. Someone new is coming. Repent. Be ready. Be ready for this new thing that God is doing. So the question is, how can we cultivate new growth even in our own times of wilderness. Now we've all been there, right? We had this discussion in Sunday school. You know, some of us view wilderness as a good thing. And wilderness can be a good thing. I often remember times when I was a child, we had this little patch of woods uh, behind my, a friend of mine's house, just a couple doors down. And, and, it, and for us, it was, it was vast woods. And it, in reality, when you, you ever go back to a place, you're like, boy, it really seemed bigger when I was a kid. Yeah, this place is like that. It was real, in reality about two acres but when I was a kid, it seemed vast, and, and we would walk through, and we would blaze trails. And, and I can remember, even as a young child, even as like a third, fourth, fifth grader, I remember being renewed and revived and strengthened by just walking through the wilderness. And in my mind, I could get completely lost. In reality, there was barbed wire fence around the whole thing. I couldn't really get lost. I wasn't in danger, but, but, but it was wilderness to me, and I enjoyed it. And it was a way for me to get out of my normal routine, the normal craziness, the, the man, I had a bad day at school, or um, boy, or, you know, I, something happened. My, my parents yelled at me which means they just got on to me. You know, that's what kids do, right? You yelled at me. No, I didn't yell at you. I got on to you. It was a way for me to get away. It was wilderness, but it was a good wilderness. But sometimes we do experience tough times of wilderness. And I'm talking about the times where we feel like not only are we not growing, but maybe life has just cut right out from under us. And we feel like we're not really producing anything. There's no, there's no fruit. In fact, if, if anything, uh, maybe we're, we're going backwards a little bit. Nothing's really happening. Maybe we feel a little bit lost. Maybe we feel like we're kind of wandering aimlessly. But I contend, and I think John the Baptist would contend, and I believe Jesus would contend, that there are ways of growing, that oftentimes that wilderness is really truly preparing us, like my tree in the front yard, preparing us to be fruitful. So how can we cultivate new growth? First of all, cultivating new growth requires us to see with new eyes. Seeing with new eyes. And we talked about this a little bit last week. And John the Baptist is saying, look, people, you've got to see this a different way. Something new is happening. Someone new is coming. Is there like a thump in my thing here that's driving anybody else nuts? Not until I said something, right? Who said yes? Kelsey. Kelsey's like, yes, I heard that the whole time. Hey, we fixed the lights on the tree, by the way. Yes, yes, yes. I know some of you are happy. If you weren't here last week, you have no idea what I'm talking about. We've got to see with new eyes, says John the Baptist. He says, someone's coming. Someone new is coming. This Messiah is coming. I'm not him. But if you don't have your eyes open, you are going to miss him. See, repentance doesn't just mean to seek forgiveness. 
See, oftentimes when we want to repent, and repentance, remember, is turning away, saying, I'm not doing that anymore, and turning away. But oftentimes we'll turn away, we'll say, I'm not doing that anymore, but we don't do the part where we actually start running toward Christ. And John the Baptist, is, is he, he's saying, look, there's someone coming, someone, someone who, who is greater than I. You think I'm good. You think this baptism is good. This man is coming. He's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. He's going to provide a way to be purified in ways that I could never offer you, says John the Baptist. But if you don't see with a new set of eyes, you're going to miss it. See, people were trapped in this idea that, that the law, that, that theology, that their lineage was going to save them. And that just wasn't the case. That's not the case. Your, your theology isn't going to save you. Your lineage isn't going to save you. Who you were born to isn't going to save you. As he told the Sadducees and the Pharisees, the law is not going to save you. We need to have new eyes to see the new things, the new way that Jesus offers. See, the Pharisees were living by the letter of the law. Don't miss this. The Pharisees were living by the letter of the law, but they often missed the spirit of the law. And if you haven't read that yet this morning in your Born the King devotional, if you read that letter later today, you'll read that quote. The Pharisees were living by the letter of the law and not by the spirit of the law. And so often we can catch ourselves doing this or we can just not even recognize the fact that we're doing it and be in trouble. So I can be driving down the road and I can be completely honoring and respecting the speed limit, right? So I, the speed limit is 55, and I, and I can stay under 55. But see, and the law says that the speed limit on this road is 55 miles per hour. But if conditions change, did you know this? If conditions change, the law is actually you need to be driving safely. I know there's, Matt, there's probably a better way to say that. But if you're driving 55 miles per hour in a snowstorm and the, the road is, is, is a sheet of ice, you're not driving by the spirit of the law. And guess what you're doing? You're saying, no, 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 no. No, I'm following all the rules. But you're putting yourself in harm's way. And you're putting others in harm's way. And the same can happen with the laws we find in Scripture. We can read Scripture and say, no, this is exactly what it says, and this is the law. And this is, so this is what the Pharisees and the Sadducees were doing. They were saying, no, this is what the law says. And they were following the spirit of the law, or the, or the letter of the law. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's good to follow the letter of the law. But Paul says, or not Paul, John the Baptist says, look, you're, yes, you're following the law, but you're missing the point. You're completely missing the point. I can be following the speed limit, but still driving recklessly. I can follow the letter of the Old Testament law, but I can still be living recklessly. We need to see with new eyes. We also need to be bearing the fruit of repentance. See, it's not enough to give lip service to this new way. It must be embodied in the way that we live. Says John. We're really good at... Um, we're really good at talking, right? We're really good sometimes at sounding spiritual. But John says, and so does Jesus later on, and so does Paul. It's not really about what you say. It's really about how you 
are living. In Galatians chapter 5, this is the fruit of the Spirit. Verse 18, Paul says, But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under law. In verse 22, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking, and envying one another. See, just as Jesus says later on, and just as Paul says, John the Baptist says, look, we can talk about this all we want, but the fact is your life needs to show that you are living by the Spirit. Produce fruit in keeping with repentance, and do not think you can say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. In fact, in verse 10, he says, The axe is already at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. And later in verse 12, he says, His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor, gathering his weed into the barn and burning up the chaff with unquenchable fire. See, there will be a division of people those who repent and follow are the wheat. Those who don't are the chaff. And I've never seen this process. I'm sure somebody could bring it to my attention or I'm sure I could have YouTubed it or something. But my understanding is there's, there's, a, there's a device, a winnowing fork that, that would separate the good stuff from the bad stuff, the stuff they wanted to keep from the stuff that really only deserved to be burnt up. And there was a separation. And, and John is saying there's going to be a separation with us as well. He will clear his threshing floor, gathering his wheat into the barn, but burning up the chaff with unquenchable fire. In other words, if we are not bearing the fruit of repentance, if we're not bearing the fruit of the Spirit, we're, we're kind of useless to God. We're useless because we're not doing what He has called us to do, and that is to live as God's children. Cultivating new growth requires living as God's children. See, God did not call rocks to be his children. God called us. Do not think you can say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. I brought one of my favorite rocks with me today. I like rocks. I know Dee Dee gets me. I like rocks. And um, this particular rock is from the coast in California, from a little little bay, a little cove. And there was just, I mean, billions of rocks, not exactly like this, but all different than this. And I and I and I collected them a couple of years ago. And um, I don't know if that was legal or not. So, um, but I'm I'm going to live by the spirit of the law instead of the letter. <laughs> God, I'm using it for an illustration. Surely it's fine, right? <laughs> Everyone else was taking them too, so that makes it okay, right? <laughs> Next week's sermon. Um, so I've got this rock, and I love this rock, and, and I don't know what it is about this rock. Part of it's the color, but, but it's just a rock. That's all it is. There's, 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 nothing, there's nothing alive about this rock. And that Paul, that's what, what John is, I keep wanting to say Paul, John the Baptist is saying, look, just because you're children of Abraham doesn't mean a thing. 
See, God can raise children, children of, of Abraham out of, out, of these, out of these rocks. But John says, no, no, your, your, your life needs to have life. There is life in us. There's no life in this rock. It's, it's, it's neat. It's cool. It feels awesome. It's really smooth. It's really light. You really want this, don't you? Yeah, I can tell. Yeah. But there's no life in it. It's not producing anything. This, this rock is doing absolutely nothing. There's no life in this rock. And many of these people claiming to be the children of Abraham were saying we're good because we're Abraham's children. We have Abraham as our father. John says, but you're, you're, you're not doing anything with it. You're living by the letter of the law that says you are Abraham's children. But you're not living by the spirit of the law that says... Abraham's children are called by God, are called to live for him. And we are part of this new kingdom that Jesus is ushering in. We are part of this kingdom. And I don't know about you, but I don't just want to be a rock that just sits around and looks neat and on the outside looks kind of cool and then later on you go, it's not really doing anything. But see, even now, even now God is creating new children. Not out of rocks, but out of us. And new life is being born all around us if we have eyes to see. So I don't know where you are right now. I don't know when I say the word wilderness and, and when, I, when I ask you, what does wilderness mean to you? For some of you, wilderness is a great opportunity. It's a great opportunity this time of year to, to get out of the routine and to get into a wilderness that you can explore and that you can be revived by, that you can go, you know what, I'm going to stay away from the hustle and the bustle of Christmas, and, and I'm really going to prepare room in my heart for Christ. If that's you, I encourage you to do this. Make that wilderness a place where you can meet with the Christ child. Where you can wait in, in longing expectation and hope just like the people of Israel did. That there is a Messiah that is coming and that there is hope found in him. And I'm going to rest in his love. But maybe for some of you, this wilderness, when I say that, makes you think of the difficult times. Justin mentioned it. We have lots of people in this congregation, connected with this congregation, that are really experiencing wilderness right now. Fruitlessness that, that is not anything that they've done themselves, but are afflictions that they are experiencing Maybe many of you are experiencing things that feel like wilderness to you right now. Let me encourage you during this season of Advent that Christ is coming. Christ is coming. Hope is here because Christ is coming. Hope is here because Christ's love prevails. And even though now may seem like a wilderness, it may feel like, what am I doing? I'm not really producing anything. It's quite possible that during this wilderness time, God is preparing you for a very fruitful time to come. I know this is not so much of a Wow, great. Oh, man, I'm leaving here feeling so good. I don't want you to leave here feeling so good. 
I want you to leave here today pondering, contemplating, wondering, what is my place in God's story? What is my place as we wait in eager anticipation and expectation during this Advent season, as we wait on the coming Christ? Christ.